Welcome. This is the Life Habits Podcast Series. My name is Carl Vredenberg. And my name is Paige Heron. This is the series that helps you to learn new habits to optimize your life and embrace an enlightened, healthy, and prosperous lifestyle. This is episode 139, and today we are sitting down with Certified Habit Finder Coach, author, business owner, and CEO, Amy Kemp. Welcome to the Life Habits Podcast, Amy. Thank you so much for having me, Paige. We are really excited to have you here and to speak with you today. I thoroughly enjoyed your book, I See You. It truly resonated with me. I found it extremely relatable. And there was quite a few times I found myself laughing out loud. I believe the message in your book will resonate universally, but also especially with women. Let's get right into it and start off, as we usually do, with the quotes you have prepared. Amy, I'll turn it over to you to share those now. Thank you so much for the compliment. I'm honored to have you as a reader and really to each reader who takes the time to experience the words on the page. So actually, I chose some quotes that are from other authors, but that are featured in the book because they're so meaningful to me. And the first one I'd love to share today comes from a book called The Now Habit by an author named Neil Fiore. And he writes, a firm commitment to guilt-free play will recharge your batteries, creating renewed motivation, creativity, and energy for all the other areas of your life. Knowing that work will not deprive you of enjoying the good things of life you can more easily tackle a large task without the fear of having it rule your life. Knowing that work on a large task will be interrupted by commitments to friends, to exercise, and to free time, you can approach the task with less fear of being overwhelmed. And I think I chose this quote because for so many years of my professional career, I neglected to prioritize guilt-free play. I didn't understand the value of scheduling time into my life on a regular basis to just have fun and that the value of that would actually stimulate some of the most inspired ideas. It would create an energy within me that attracted people to me and to the work that I do. But I take this so seriously, (laughs) guilt-free play. In fact, I'm leaving after we record the podcast today. We're heading up to Chicago to see Zach Brown Band and Kenny Chesney and Uncle Cracker in concert with my kids and some other friends. And I just know that the energy I'm even bringing to this conversation is higher, knowing that like I have something so fun coming up (laughs) and that I can enjoy it fully because I've been fully present in the work that I do as well. So that's the first one. The second one, this is a really simple one, but it is a mantra of mine. And it is that imperfect progress is better than perfect procrastination. Perfect is a trap for me. I really love things to feel perfect. (laughs) I enjoy doing things with excellence. I want to perform at high levels. But I also know that perfect is an illusion and it's an unattainable standard. And it's one that keeps people from creating what they are designed to create maybe in their lives. More than anything, it's just this expectation of perfect. And so it's exhausting. It's a driver that leads to unhealthy outcomes. And what I've learned is just If I can get something out into the world as, you know, kind of like as good as possible at this moment and then get feedback and refine it and refine it and refine it, that I actually end up with a better product than if I'm waiting and waiting for the perfect thing to put out into the world. So, yeah. I love those quotes. And in fact, the focus on not being perfect will also give you more time to have fun. Oh, so true. (laughs) And to put those two quotes together, I think that it's also a great grounding in what we're going to be talking about today in terms of your book and the like as well. So I too, similar to Paige, I really, really found your book fascinating. As a man, even, I know that's not your primary intended audience, but I'd love for you to share with us your 
journey in getting to the business that you now have and the role that you have as a certified habit finder coach and CEO? And also, what is a habit finder coach for those who have (laughs) never heard that term before? Yes, I would love to share that. My professional background, I originally was a high school English teacher and loved that work. I do love high school kids. They're making important decisions and you can have great conversations with them. So I did that for five years. And on the side during those five years, started a very small direct selling business that I thought would just pay for some extra things and ended up becoming my full-time work for about 20 years, actually. I led uh, the number one team of sales consultants in that particular company in the nation and really learned through those 20 years what being an entrepreneur meant. I learned a lot about women and what holds them back because most of the people I was leading were women. And I really learned that I was a leader for maybe the first time. I don't, I think I always led, but I didn't really consider myself a leader until that experience. And so the work of building that business was full of challenge and joy. And I really relished it. I loved running a business, turns out, and have a great strategic business mind. And so that was amazing. About eight years ago, I felt the beginnings of a transition. And when I talk to people about transition, I think it's important to note that when you're entering into a season of transition, things that always felt totally comfortable, things you enjoyed, things at least you didn't hate, become almost just unbearable. You, it, you just can't bring yourself to do them anymore. We don't really get to pick when the transition starts or why, but probably a series of events led to that feeling. And I started at the same time to have all these conversations with women that I knew just from my normal day-to-day life about this experience of being a woman who has accomplished some things or who is leading people or who has a big role. And these themes were isolation, overwhelm, not being understood, not really having a safe place where you could talk about the experience of what you were going through. And I was paying attention to these kind of nudges of just, you know, what could I, what if I brought these women together? What could I create? What, what kind of a safe place could I facilitate? And this would be outside of the context of my other business. And all of that felt sort of crazy because the other business was so consuming and I was in such a public facing role there. I mean, in a weird way, kind of famous in this very small world, right? And so as it happens, I was in Salt Lake City speaking at an event, met with a business coach that I had worked with who used the Habit Finder assessment tool. And when I worked with this coach, I will tell you my business quadrupled in size. And he and I together identified some things that were holding me back internally that I had never known were even happening because they were happening at a subconscious level. Now, we're having dinner in Salt Lake City because we had maintained a friendship. He says, I think you should take action on this idea to work with these women. I really think you need to do something with this. It's showing up, pay attention. And he said, we're starting a training for new habit finder coaches on Monday. And I mean, to say that I had never considered it or thought of doing it ever until that moment, I mean, ever would be so true. (laughs) But I really, in my gut, it was just this knowing of yes. And so that was on a Thursday. I went home and talked it over with my husband who said, go for it and started the training and then really started my first groups of women shortly thereafter. So I use this tool called the Habit Finder. It's an assessment tool that you can actually take for free on my website. And it measures your risk of falling into certain subconscious habits of thinking. So if you're at high or low risk of really going down these grooves in your brain, that you aren't even aware are happening. And then there's a curriculum that corresponds with it. So now I work in small groups with only women, but then I do work one-on-one. I do have male clients also. The marketing of my business is largely geared toward women, but I work one-on-one with clients as well. 
in using these tools to help other people with these habits of thinking. Fascinating transition. Long story. <laughs> I know. I love that. I love that. Also, book titles really fascinate mm. me. And I absolutely love your book title of I See You. How did you come up with that title? And can you tell us a little bit about sort of how the overall book is structured, kind of the exercises that you have in each chapter? Tell us a little bit about the book. Sure. I did fight for the title. I will tell you, I'm proud of the title because it felt inspired. It felt like I received the title and it was important to me. The work I do is not, I am not central to the work that I do. The people that I serve are central to the work that I do. The trend, particularly if you even do a search for women and business books, is this sort of like hyper masculinized, like I'm a, you know, I'm a power, blah, blah, blah. like it's got this real loud energy to it, or like a fighting kind of energy that could not be further than the energy from which I work. I don't even, I'm not angry. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually really peaceful and grounded. And the work that I do, I think a lot of people are drawn to me because they want that experience and they don't want to be angry. They don't want to fight. They just want to feel seen and understood. The title was inspired by a conversation. I love this story. There was a woman that I was introduced to briefly at a community event. She is exceptionally talented. She sits at some really important tables in our community. She has a big role in the company where she works, very active with her kids. And when I met her, I thought, oh, I really, I really liked her. And so I reached out and just invited her to have a cup of coffee. I listened to her for about, for about an hour at this coffee shop, just hearing her story. How did you get to be where you are? I don't know much about you. Tell me about you. And it almost we're nearing the end, she kind of abruptly and sort of brusquely says, why did you invite me here today? <laughs> and without hesitation, I don't, I don't even know where the words came from, but I just said, because I see you. And she put her head in her hands and wept. And it was for a long time, uncomfortably long for me, but I just sort of let her. And then she sat up and kind of wiped her eyes. And she said, thank you. So few people do. And so at that moment, I knew, yes, that's my reader. Everyone sees her. Everyone sees her, but no one really sees her experience. And I need to create a safe space, even in the format of a book that gives this reader the feeling of being seen and understood. So that's the inspiration for the title. And I must say that reading the book, I did very much feel seen. And when I go back to saying that it resonated with me, that was part of it. It was very much that you were talking directly to me and my experience. So the book title, I think, works very well. Now, you alluded to this a little bit earlier about thought habits. So can you talk to us about how deeply rooted thought habits can limit our success? And can you also share some specific examples of some of those limiting thought habits? I can. So we have two minds. We have our conscious mind and then we have our subconscious mind. We largely live in our conscious mind and are unaware of all that's happening below the surface when actually the subconscious mind is processing and has the capability of processing so much more at such a faster pace. And we aren't always harnessing it or really addressing what's going on at that, you know, lower level or bringing it to the surface. So I think what I would say is that a lot of our behaviors, a lot of our choices, a lot of the ways that we show up in conversations the way that we're growing our businesses, the choices we're making and how we present ourselves to the world are being driven by the subconscious mind and not the conscious mind. We aren't consciously thinking about these things that are holding us back. Let me give you an example because it does feel a little bit hmm, vague or it's, it's kind of out there. 
but it's actually really concrete. So I'll give you an example that I see a ton, particularly with people who work in a more entrepreneurial role or a role where maybe you get paid on commission or where you are trying to grow something. So there's a habit of thinking where your brain can go to the fantastical, to the preferred future that you can see out there in the future somewhere, or it can go to catastrophe, the worst case scenario very easily. So um, let me think of a really good example, even from this week, I can give you examples in my day to day life every day. Oh, one, one that's easy. Well, this one actually is a little bit in the book as well. But my son who is 13 is intense. (laughs) And he is joyful, and he is energetic, and he is absolutely going to make a mark on the world. We're just hoping it's a good one, right? But he will often do things. And this is the story in the book where it was in the summer, I hear all these boys and I hear this like chanting, yelling. So I go to the sliding door of my backyard, and I look out and he is on the trampoline with a hose. And if you can imagine like a rock star, he's like got his head back and he's spraying the hose in his mouth and he's surrounded by these neighbor kids who are chanting like, and they're chanting. Okay. So my brain has this subconscious habit of going to catastrophe or fantasy very quickly and very easily. I'm not kidding you within 10 seconds. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, he's going to go to college and then he's going to be at a party and he's going to be chugging something. And then I'm going to get a call and I'm going to be called to the emergency room because he is, you know, I can go to the worst case rendition of that (laughs) instead of just saying like, here's a bunch of kids having a great time in the summer and enjoying themselves. But we do this with our work a lot. We do this with our outcomes. We get very attached. We think, I want to get here and I can see it so clearly. And when I get there, I'm going to be happy. I know I'm going to be happy when I get that promotion or that level of income or when I achieve that goal, then I finally will feel happy. And we attach all of these conditions for happiness and value to getting there in our brain instead of being right here in the moment. So that would be an example. We aren't aware that we're flipping to fantasy or catastrophe so quickly, but it's happening all the time. And it's robbing us of presence right here, like where our feet are. Then we're not fully present where we are and enjoying it. So we take that same story that you're just telling. How does a listener listening to us right now that wants to identify the thought habits that hinder them and then will actually change them to be positive ones, even the story you just told, how do you actually intervene in your own thinking to change and make that pivot? Oh, such a good question. Awareness plays a huge role. Even just the awareness that what I'm doing is fantasy or catastrophe, right? I just did this even with the launch of my book. For some reason, (laughs) I got in my mind during the pre-ordering phase a number that I thought I would have sold. But when you're, I guess this is a little back window view of the publishing world. So you don't get to find out how many pre-orders have happened until the day the book actually launches. And so you have no access to that dashboard until that day. So I had all of these weeks where I was building up this story of how I was going to feel when I saw this number on the screen and whatever. So the number pops up and it's decidedly less than what I thought it was or what I thought it was going to be. And so (laughs) sometimes what will happen, I had basically built a fantasy, right? I had built a fantasy of this number. I had gotten attached to it thinking how I was going to feel when I saw that number and how I was going to be so proud of it. And it was going to blah, blah, blah. The irony is the whole time I've been writing the book, I've been saying the launch of this book, I want to be consistent I want to be gradual. I want it to be, I'm not disrupting my life for it because there's too many important things happening in my world right now to miss, but I will work at it very consistently over a long period of time. It doesn't all have to happen at once. Okay, so all that said, the number shows up. I am feeling so bad about it. And so I walk out to the kitchen and my son is standing there. He's 18 
And he said, mom, how are the book sales? Like, what did you find out about the number? Because they kind of knew we were waiting for this number. And I said, well, I'm kind of disappointed. Like I, I feel really sad. Like it feels bad. I don't feel like this number is very high. And (laughs) he looked at me and he said, well, isn't it like the first day it's out right now? And I started laughing one because yeah, it was right. And two, and then, and then he said, and didn't you say that like, you didn't need it to all be all of the sales in the first couple of days that you were going to work at it for years. And really, you know, he was kind of repeating what I had been telling them. And so one thing that disrupts these subconscious habits of thinking is laughter, which is, it's like, oh my goodness, there it is. It's just this recognition of that's just a thought. Like that was just a thought that sent me into that whole emotional experience. It wasn't real. It was just a thought that I had attached value to. The second thing is talking out loud. So his words out loud and then our conversation helped me to bring the subconscious thought to the surface and say, there it was. I went from fantasy to catastrophe. It's like in two seconds, I went from, I'm going to sell a bajillion books in one day to this is a failure. This is a complete failure, (laughs) right? Which is so ridiculous and so not true at all. So again, it's those things of, of recognition, talking about it, and then even laughter, bringing it to the surface where you're recognizing that's just a thought. It's not me. Really, really important. I also think that the fact that you talk to, in this case, your, your son, it's probably a way of reflecting back as well. So you're not just doing this in your own head that you're actually, and he, and he was playing back to you what you had been saying, but some of the time we just get distance on our, our own thinking when we involve somebody else, especially somebody that cares for us, mm-hmm. that can help sort of set the uh, record straight for us, right? A hundred percent. Absolutely. Because they will be able to pull you out of the depths of that and offer a different perspective. I've been asking clients a ton lately in the last few weeks. Yes, that's one story you could tell about what just happened. Is there another potential story that's more compassionate to you? And it's amazing when they run it through that lens where they'll come up with a totally different story that serves them better and causes them to show up for their family and their work with more confidence and also just more peace. You know, it's not, it, if in the book I write, like, if you're going to make up a story, you might as well make up a good one in so many instances, because if one thing could be true, so could another, we don't know. And so just make up the good one that serves you best instead of the worst case scenario. Yeah, that happens so much. I just actually was talking to a client this week. She had a really horrible employee and it took a long time to move him along down the road due to a lot of HR policies and things like that. And she started telling herself this story that she wasn't a good leader. I mean, he was a first class bad employee, right? And she's an excellent leader. And I said, you're tell me the story you're telling yourself around this employee. And she had built this whole narrative about her lack of leadership, her, I should have done this better. I didn't train him well. And then I said, what's a more compassionate version of the same story? And then she paused for a long time. She said, he was terrible. (laughs) (laughs) And I said, so could either be true? Yes. But do you get to choose? Yes. Well, which story serves you better? Like, just pick the better story then. He doesn't know. (laughs) Nobody else is going to (laughs) know. So anyhow, we had a good chuckle because she just said, oh, he was terrible, which actually (laughs) probably was closer to the truth. (laughs) That that section of your book where you were saying, if you're going to tell yourself a story, tell yourself a good one was one of those sections I was laughing to myself, just kind of reflecting on, you know, the worst case scenario stories I often go to. So good reminder to try and frame it in the positive. Something else that you talked about in your book is identifying your natural genius and leveraging those talents. Can you explain what you mean by natural genius and how we can learn to recognize our own and start to leverage it? Mm -hmm. 
Ugh. People have a hard time identifying their natural genius. And I think the reason is that it feels so easy to us when we are acting in and working in our natural genius. And so we assume that everyone else, it's easy for them as well. I'll give you an example of usually natural genius shows up at a very young age. And if you look back over your life, you can kind of trace patterns of it. But when I was really little, I had a club in our neighborhood. You had to put a piece of chewed gum on this one tree to get in. And I would lead these small group gatherings where we would talk about how we were going to make the neighborhood a better place. And I was the facilitator of these small group conversations and all the things that we were going to do. And when I look back at every, everything I've done in my whole life, I have done that. I've gathered small groups of people and facilitated conversations. I did it as play when I was a child, right? And then I did it in every business I've run. I did it as a teacher. I would always gather kids in small groups and let's talk about this book and let's talk about how it, right? So I was constantly facilitating conversations. So I thought everyone could do that. I just thought that's just what you do. You just talk about things. And what I've learned is that I've tried, I've watched other people try to do it and they're actually quite terrible at it. (laughs) And so I learned, oh my goodness, Everyone can't do that. That's an area of natural genius. And here's the other shift. I can get paid large quantities of money for these rare things that only I can do if I can harness them and use them to serve people in spaces where they are willing to exchange money for that natural genius. So what I find is that we undervalue the natural genius because it feels so easy to us. We think, how could I ever get paid for that? That's so easy to me. Uh, So the question is, what do you do that feels easy to you, but astonishes everyone else where they say like, how do you do that? I don't know how you do that. People feel so safe when they're talking to you or when you organize that it's more clear to everyone and they can use it more effectively. So I think in terms of finding your own natural genius, some of it is looking back for patterns, right? Looking back to what have I always done? Every role I've had, this is what I brought to it that was unique, that caused it to grow or change or become really great. Also, asking people, asking people, what do you see in me? I often just find, I there was a, book club that I has meets locally and they read my book. So I just went to participate in their book club discussion. And I know the leader of the book club really well. She lives in our community and has a job. And she said, I don't, I don't know what my, I don't know what my natural genius is. And I said, Oh, I, I know. (laughs) She was like, what? I said, you love connecting people with resources that will help them. You love hearing what they need. You listen really well. And then you know, oh, if we just need this tool for you, or we need this resource, or if I could connect you with this person, then we can move you forward where you want to where you want to go, which fits perfectly with the work she does also. And she sat there and she said, I do love that. I love that. I love doing that. And you could hear it in her voice. She's like, I feel so alive when I do that. So good. (laughs) And so it's that conversation. You've got to ask people who are good at observing it. Uh, maybe my one of my other natural geniuses is being able to see the natural genius in other people too. So it is fun though when you find it and then you harness it and use it to serve the world and you get paid for it. It's the best. So to dig in a little bit more for those who are struggling to identify this natural genius with women in particular, you mentioned this in your book, we're taught from a young age to undervalue ourselves, to hide our talents, hide our strengths, to not boast as a way to fit in. So with that in mind, as adults, there's likely a lot of self-esteem issues. So maybe even when someone says, you know, it's amazing, you can do that, that's your natural genius, and you're having a hard time believing that. What's your advice to those who are really struggling, even if it's being presented to them, or they can look back and see the patterns that you were talking about? Yeah. 
Can I ask you a question about that? Sure. (laughs) So does that resonate with you? Like, is there, is it difficult? Can you empathize with that feeling? I think that when someone tells me that I'm really good at something, Carl's nodding his head because he knows, I, I go, oh, yeah, you know, I just kind of push it down. It's not, not something I, I, can, I will believe truly. Mm. So it's a lot easier to go, oh, they just think that mm. and, and they're probably wrong or they're just saying that to be nice, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. It's hard to receive it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does, is it, you just don't trust it? It's like a sort of a skepticism. Yeah, you could say that. Mm -hmm. And do you think that protects you from something? I think on a subconscious level, yes. Mm -hmm. And what would you guess it would protect you from? Like what might happen if you accepted it or received it? Maybe failure or rejection. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Because the receiving of that, I think, is more terrifying than just the hiding and being invisible. If If I received that and believed it, and then I really acted on it, it might put me in some spaces where then there would be expectations and there would be attention and there would be reward that I'm not sure I'm worthy of or ready for or that I have earned is what I find with most women. There's a real, it's, it's a protection because if I'm the compassionate interpretation from my perspective is that for generations, thousands of years, women have survived by fitting in, assimilating, attaching to community not standing out, right? That was our survival. And so I think it's in our cells (laughs) that standing out or really excelling and shining can be dangerous, especially now. I mean, danger in our current iteration isn't being attacked by another animal or something. I don't know, maybe, but it's more rejection from social groups or attacks that come through social media or from people even that we really care about giving us hard feedback. And that feels horrible. But there is this, I've got to believe a level of worthiness has to exist for me to be able to receive even the idea that I have natural genius. And then there's a whole nother level of I should get paid for it. That's like a whole other topic. (laughs) But it is something that I don't think in our current world is serving women where it's time for us to sort of evolve into a new way of being and contribution. We have something our world needs really desperately right now. Everyone does, not just women, but women in particular, I think we need some of the things that they bring. And so it's one of the most important facets of my work is how do we help women be able to receive that more so that then they can use the gifts more in their unique ways. You also just talked about then getting paid for that natural Mm -hmm. genius. And I want to dig into that a little bit more. So if you've identified this natural genius or somebody else has helped you and that you actually accept it and you're now ready to want to make it a business, let's say, Mm-hmm. How do you determine the value of that sort of natural genius? And as we've been saying, women often are undervalued or they have been taught to undervalue their superpowers, let's say. But how can they overcome that and, and specifically actually determine what the value you know, might be? And also, you talk about that a lot of what's caught up in this thinking is a person's relationship with money itself. And that relationship is a factor that, you know, influences this thinking process. So I wonder if you could talk about that a bit. Mm -hmm. Can I really quick ask if you think that men struggle? I know you can't speak for all men, but right. But do you feel like men also struggle with that same thing that we were just talking about? I think they do. I think it's also okay. I think there's a gender difference. I think there's also just uh, as Paige was getting at earlier, I think, a 
self-esteem mm-hmm. issue and that mm-hmm. it's probably maybe even more important than even the gender one in terms of if you really don't feel confident yes. in your own abilities, then you're more likely to devalue yourself and not accept compliments and all that kind of thing. But I think that the notion of determining your value, though, is something that is a challenge, I think, across the board. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do some advising uh, now and I'm needing to determine, you know, the price of that. And a lot Uh of the time before I've I've worked in an organization that always determined that for me before. So I just love to get your thinking on Mm. how do you start that process of determining now you've got this, Mm -hmm. you know, natural genius, you've identified it and you want to now make it a business. Yeah. How do you go about determining that value? What do you charge for your... If you want to know every unhealthy habit of thinking in your brain, just go ahead and try to price a service that is centralized in you, right? That you are sort of the product. You will get to meet and encounter every single (laughs) unhealthy habit of thinking that exists in your brain. It is one of the most, I've seen it actually take people out. They will retreat back to a regular job. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I really don't. But I, I have seen people run for the hills when they, when all of that noise starts to come up and you're trying to attach a number to something like this. One, I think there's something to do with, we will not out earn our feeling of worthiness and value. So subconsciously, if you believe you're worth this much, and maybe that's because someone has told you that you're worth this much, or this contribution is worth this much. If you don't believe you're worth more, you will figure out how to get yourself back down to the lower level of earning. I've seen people do the craziest things, create conflict, create drama, get sick, injuries, because they outperformed their level of worthiness internally, and then it brought their income back down. I mean, I've seen the craziest things. It's unbelievable. And I, don't, I don't really don't think they know they're doing it. So I think there's this process of growing yourself, because if your self-esteem isn't growing, your personal development isn't happening, but your earnings are outpacing it you will kind of figure out how to blow the money or how to stop earning that much. I know people always talk about when people earn the lottery or win the lottery because, you know, they typically lose all of the money. It's because they don't feel worthy of it. And so they figure out how to lose it and get rid of it. It's so uncomfortable. Money is probably the most accurate mirror of our self-esteem and self-worth in so many situations, not always, I I don't want to make a blanket statement, but when you're an entrepreneur, particularly, because you really get to see, oh, this is what I think I'm worth. I've kind of hit a plateau here. And what is preventing me from receiving at a higher level usually comes down to this feeling of, I don't know if I'm worth it. I don't really know if I deserve that. Is that too much for me? Is that selfish? If I earn that, am I taking it away from someone else? What will people say about me? You know, what will they think about me charging for this type of service when other people are charging this and I'm charging this? I see people struggle with this, particularly in fields of like service to people, where then it feels exceptionally selfish to charge for that. Mine has been gradual, this increase of what I believe I'm worth. And I think I'm still in the process of that. And I don't think big jumps help us. And I don't know that going from here to like, woof, is healthy. I think it's a more gradual, oh, I see, I start to believe I'm worth more. I charge a little more. Oh, I'm working. I'm doing this work. I'm getting feedback on it. I'm getting better at it. But that's not why I'm raising my prices. It's because I'm believing I'm worth more as I'm doing that creative work and really contributing. At this point in in my journey, I actually do have enough evidence of the life change and the business change and the increase in income even of my clients to feel fully confident of my rates that I'm charging right now. Because I'm like, oh my goodness, if you're getting a $40,000 raise, or you've quadrupled your income, or you've 
tripled your revenue or your business has grown by 50%. Like that's a worthwhile investment. (laughs) But what we worked on wasn't how to earn more money. What we worked on was the inside stuff that's keeping you from receiving more money. That's the distinction. It's not the external skill. There are some external skills, but that really, usually most people have those down. It's more about this worthiness that really gets at the heart of it. I find that so insightful, Amy, that a measure of your self-esteem is what you should be charging for your services. That is just so insightful, I think. So, you know, it's, it's really clear from reading your book that you're a voracious reader. Mm. And uh, what other books, in addition to your own, would you recommend listener listen to or, re- or read that may give them even more in depth on some of the topics that we talked about, if you have any of those? I love the books. I love all the books. I love the words. I love, (laughs) I love reading books. And from a very young age, I found books to be a source of such inspiration for me and a place. They were places I could go without leaving my house. They were friends. They were masters in certain fields that I could access. And so I have a collection of books I will never lend out to anyone. They're like my top, top, top books, right? I've read a lot of books, but these are like the gold standard books. Probably I'll tell you the books I recommend to people the most. Uh, One is called Secrets of Six Figure Women. It was written by Barbara Stanny, uh, now Barbara Hewson. And basically Barbara was a struggling journalist who was making very little money and was given an assignment to interview women who earned six figures or more. And she went into these interviews with all of these preconceived notions of what these women were going to be like and what their lives were going to be like. And what she discovered transformed her life. And then she went on to write Overcoming Under Earning, which actually I feel like is almost a better rendition, but uh, you do need to read the first one to kind of get the story. But the the work of it is that all of these stories we have around money, celebrating the nobility of poverty, believing that if we earn more, other people won't, you know, really under believing that we have to work more hours to earn more. All of these narratives that we have built in aren't true and they're not serving us and we get to choose, right? So I'm really proud on the cover of my book, actually, there's an endorsement from Barbara. I've gotten to know her over the years, I think because I've just really endorsed her work so much and her book so much, and I love it so much. So that's one I always recommend. Another one that I talk about in the book, and it's a book that I use with my clients, is The Greatest Salesman in the World by Og Mandino. This is a famous book. It's old. I always preface it by saying that the language is antiquated and masculine, but it's exceptional. And I discovered this book, the material of the Habit Finder, the curriculum that I use is built around this book. The owners of the company who run the Habit Finder, they own the intellectual property of Ogmandino. So it is foundational to the work I do. But I actually read the book way before I knew about the Habit Finder. And I used these 10 scrolls that are in the book. I would read it in the morning, read it after lunch, read it before bed. And that was transformational in my business. Again, before I even knew there was a whole company or a whole structure that was built around these principles. So still today, I read a scroll every morning. And I think those scrolls, things like I will greet this day with love in my heart. I will persist until I succeed. There's a line in scroll four that says, I am rare and there is value in all rarity. Therefore, I am valuable. That like those messages are so deeply ingrained in my mind now. They're like a part of who I am. And that's what I think the power of language is. Like words give us so much. I I revere that. I respect, I honor words so much because I think they're so important. So. Those are two I would definitely recommend. I love books. Can you tell I love books? (laughs) Yes. And being a former English teacher, it all makes sense, right? It does. (laughs) So I have really enjoyed our conversation and I know Carl has too, but unfortunately we are out of time for this episode. But 
We will continue this fascinating conversation next week. But before we wrap up, Amy, can you share where we can go to get a copy of your book, where we can go to learn more about you, your coaching business, and how to get in contact with you? Easiest place is amykemp.com. So my name, which is A-M-Y-K-E-M-P.com. Uh, you can read about my book there, find some really great additional resources for it. And also just learn more about the coaching work that I do and take the habit finder assessment for free there, which is really cool. You get the results right away and you get kind of a 44 page PDF with the results. So if you're really into data and you want to dig in, you can get in there and read about it too. I also would invite people, you can find the book anywhere you purchase books. So Amazon, Barnes and Noble, bookshop.org, all of those, but it's also an audible. So a lot of my readers are listeners and I, I love that. And I recorded it. So it is my voice reading it. If you are a listener of books and then last on social media, I'm mostly on Facebook and Instagram, and that's just under Amy Kemp Inc. So you can find me there as well and follow along. And Paige and I are both listeners of books as well, uh, most of the time, because we need to get through a lot of books and you can do other things while you listen. So that's how we consumed your book as well. So Amy, thank you so much for this conversation and we will continue it next week. Thank you so much. Talk to you then. I'd like to ask you to contribute what you can financially, either as a one-time payment with our tip jar, or better yet, select a recurring monthly contribution. Just click on the tip jar link or the support the podcast link in the show notes. You can also go to our website, lifehabitspodcast.com and click on the support the podcast tab. Doing that will ensure that Paige and I will be able to continue to bring this podcast to you each week. I've never had advertising or asked for contributions during my previous 16 years because it wasn't my job. This is Paige's job. And so I would greatly appreciate it if you could consider contributing financially to the podcast. Thanks so much. Visit our website, lifehabitspodcast.com to sign up for our newsletter, get in touch with us and find our social media pages. If you love our podcast, please give us a rating in the app you're listening to us on, follow us and share us with your friends. And with that, Carl and I would like to thank you for listening to this podcast. We appreciate you. We'll talk to you next time and bye for now.